uh, it is now my pleasure to turn things over to Tom Super. He does a lot of connecting with our team in his role as an Alliance board member. Tom is the Senior Vice President of Communications at the National Chicken Council, and he will be moderating our next panel, Conversations That Cultivate Trust, Staking Your Claim on the Plant-Based Plate. Thank you to Zoetis for sponsoring this panel. Zoetis is also the official hydration sponsor of my home office, so we appreciate Zoetis for your sponsorship of this panel and your support of the Alliance. With that, I will welcome Tom to the stage and turn everything over to him. Thank you, Hannah. Can you see me and hear me okay? Yes, sir. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to give you a well-deserved break over the next two days. Um, and I wanna congratulate you and, and Kay and Casey and Najaya uh, and probably Allison too for, for all of your work and effort into converting this summit into a virtual event. And thanks to John Blue at Truffle Media for, for all of his work on the technical side as well. Um, this was a huge amount of time and effort that went into this that most of us probably don't realize um, in what seems like an eternity, but was really in a very short period of time. So, so kudos to you guys. Thanks so and, much. And as important, I'd like to thank all of our friends at Zoetis for sponsoring this panel. And I know I'm biased, but also congratulating them on sponsoring the best panel of the summit. So thanks guys. As Hannah said, our, our panel today is titled Conversations That Cultivate Trust, Staking Your Claim on the Plant-Based Plate. And the next 45 minutes or so will be a candid conversation about the latest consumer buzzwords you all already understand the importance of delivering facts that are true to the science and safety of food production. Now it's time to elevate your messages to effectively showcase your products as an integral part of the plant-based plate. Our first panelist, Nicole Rodriguez, is a registered dietitian and certified personal trainer who resides in the Metro New York City area where she offers in-home meal prep, small group training, and one-on-one -on -one fitness coaching. A passionate master of beef advocacy, she's on an eternal quest for the best burger and sharing facts about the industry along the way. Now, one of the things I like to do is add a little color uh, to everyone's bio. So I, I got with the panelists before the session, and I wanted to ask them a, a few questions beforehand, and I'll, I'll say those answers as part of, of their bios. Nicole's first concert was Randy Travis with her grandparents, her first professional sporting event was the Mets Red Sox World Series game, the game six in 1986. Uh, I don't know how much you know about baseball, but that was the very famous World Series game in which the Mets were down by two runs, two outs, nobody on, and came, came uh, back in the bottom of the 10th inning to win that game on the famous Bill Buckner uh, error and went on to win the World Series uh, in the next game seven. And they stunk, and they've stunk ever since. No, I'm just kidding. I can, I'm giving a dig as a Phillies fan. Um, her favorite COVID show has been The Killing Season. Uh, and now, of course, I had to ask each of the panelists this question. As for her favorite chicken dish, she can't decide between buffalo chicken pizza and chicken and waffles, which is a tough decision. Uh, next on the panel is Kara Harbstreet, a Kansas City-based intuitive eating registered dietitian and nationally recognized food and nutrition expert, author, and consultant. Kara is passionate about helping people rediscover joy in eating nourishing meals without restriction or fear and enjoys candid conversations about the food system, nutrition, and cooking. Kara had to dig back, but her first concert was Dave Matthews Band. Her first pro sporting game was a Kansas City Royals baseball game. Her favorite binge-worthy show has been Magic for Humans on Netflix. There's new episodes coming out, which she's very excited about. Her go-to chicken dish right now is yogurt marinated chicken kebabs with a cilantro dipping sauce. She swears that it's worth it, um, and she's already done it three times since it's been uh, warm outside. Our final panelist, Allie Webster, is the Director of Research and Nutrition Communications at the International Food Information Council a DC-based nonprofit focused on providing science-based information about nutrition, food production, and food safety to the public. In this role, she's responsible for leading IFIC's consumer research efforts and nutrition programming. Allie's first concert was Faith Hill 
at the Rose Oak County Fair when she was eight years old back in her tiny Minnesota hometown, way back before Faith Hill became famous. Her first pro sporting event was a Minnesota Twins baseball game and is still a long suffering Twins fan. Having a one year old son at home since mid March has put a little bit of a damper on her ability to binge watch TV shows, but she was recently able to sneak in an episode of Mrs. America on Hulu. Allie's re her, her recent favorite chick chicken dish is a barefoot Contessa re recipe for chicken thighs with mustard sauce. Now, I'd like to know what the audience thinks about all of those chicken dishes. So, John, can you go ahead and, and post that poll, please? Awesome. Thank you. So with that, I will turn it over to Nicole, Tara, and Ali in that order to give their presentations. Thank you so much and welcome. Hi, Tom. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I still don't know what my dad was thinking, taking me at five years old to that game, but I was there. And today we want to have some conversations that cultivate trust. As we learned in our last session, words really matter. And we want to talk about some ways that you and the animal ag center uh, sector can stake your claim on the plant-based plate. As Tom mentioned, I'm a registered dietitian and NASM certified personal trainer. Uh, so I'm really coming from the perspective of talking about active individuals and how your products fuel their lifestyles. Uh, as far as a disclosure, I am a consultant for Northeast Beef Promotion Initiative who provided an, honor an honorarium for this presentation. However, I'd also like to mention I am a, a master of beef advocacy and top of the class graduate as well. So my love for beef and all the other delicious animal things is true. So we're going to kick it off with another poll if Hannah has that queued up. So how do you define plant-based? Is it vegan, vegetarian, crazy, or just following a balanced diet? Okay, so overwhelmingly, more than half of us equate plant-based with vegetarian. And coming in second, vegan. And I think we've seen that more and more veganism has been equated with plant-based. So we wanna dive into some of that today. So when I think plant-based for myself and when I'm discussing this publicly or personally with clients, I say look no further than our very own government regulations, which is my plate. You can see that we're talking about half a plate filled with fruits and vegetables, a quarter with grains, and then there's room for protein. There is room for dairy. And on the right, you can see an example from Dr. Mike Roussel's Strength the Field Manual. This is a recipe that you can see incorporates all of those things in balance. So when we're talking about my plate, I'd also like to point out, you might have seen different things on varying your proteins. Even for an individual who is getting less than 30 minutes of exercise a day, uh, a male, for example, we're still talking about five to six ounces of protein per day. So if we're looking at these three ounce portions at a couple of meals, you can see that those recommendations are really right in line and there's room for you guys on that plate. So why are we advocating for meat in general? Uh, you might have seen some of these slides before. When I'm working with individuals, again, they're active. And as a dietitian, I'm encouraging people to be active anyway. So there's a lot of research pointing to getting your protein in in these 30 gram sort of boluses throughout the day and not just waiting till dinner to get it all in. And you can see this is from Beef It's What's For Dinner, for example. It's really easy to take three ounces of beef, and there's your 25 grams for a meal. You can round that out with a bit of animal protein, but you could see with some of these other examples, 
from a caloric perspective, it's going to be uh, a lot more costly. And we're also talking a lot of volume if we're trying to get that 25 to 30 gram shot of protein from, an, from a plant-based source. So how do we start having the conversation where we bridge the gap? What are we talking about? We're not saying that we should only be eating meat. Um, we're not going to that extreme. But from the perspective of someone who is raising animals for this delicious, nutritious protein we all enjoy, uh, I think a perspective that resonates is plants need animals and animals need plants. Every time I hear Dr. Sarah Place speaking, and she was on a panel earlier in the summit, this is one of the big takeaways from her. Agriculturally, you work together, and on the plate, you work together too. So that's what we're trying to showcase today. So that's all about building trust with that other 75% of the plate. And how I've been doing that personally on social media, um, for one, I've partnered with Fruits and Veggies like Cara as an ambassador this year. So I'm promoting those whole plant products that would fill up the other half of my plate and making sure people don't think I'm only eating cheeseburgers and steaks all day. and having some of those conversations about sustainability. And Kara will go into this a bit further, um, but a couple of points here. I think it's important to pay attention to trend lines instead of headlines. So things like plant-based meats might be top of mind right now, but we know that the trends reflect that's not really what the consumer is after overall. And a lot of those consumers may be picking those products, but it's within the context of enjoying animal products throughout the week, uh, throughout the week as well. So I'm not really speaking to people who are completely vegan or trying to convert someone who's carnivore, but more trying to normalize meat and other animal products as part of that overall sustainable diet. And Kara. All right, thank you so much, Nicole. Um, Nicole has graciously offered to help me with advancing the slides so that we can hopefully minimize any technical issues. Um, but when I also thank Tom for that wonderful introduction, it's certainly been one of the most engaging of all the virtual events I've attended. And also a big thank you to the Animal Ag Alliance, to Hannah and her team for pulling this panel session together. So as Nicole had mentioned, um, she'll be advancing the slides momentarily, but as we move into this topic of sustainability, we're really echoing a similar message. So attempting to build that balanced plate from all points of view. Obviously, as a dietitian, I have my bias to look towards that end of the spectrum, but we can't forget that balance and sustainability tend to have very different connotations and meanings depending on whoever it is that we're talking about. I thought that our first session today did an excellent job leading into this. So Nicole, if you want to advance to the next slide, please. Um, this is just another brief introduction to myself and where you can find me to connect and continue this vibrant conversation online once the summit is finished. And then to share a disclosure of mine, I partner with the Missouri Beef Industry Council. So you may have noticed a very beef-centric theme with our introductions, but like Nicole, I share a deep passion for cooking with various types of proteins and love to explore these different flavors and how they pair well together in the kitchen. So... Next slide, please. Um, for this brief introduction before we dive into questions, I wanted to borrow a phrase from Dr. Jennifer Otten. She is a professor with the School of Public Health at the University of Washington, and she was the first to introduce me to this concept of the trade-offs and unintended consequences when we're looking at food systems as a whole. I think as a dietitian, our view is somewhat narrow in, at some times because we do tend to hone in on that nutrition messaging alone. But when we're speaking with people, we often find out that as they're sitting across from us in a counseling session, 
we might be using the same terms or phrases, but intending them to have a very different meaning depending on the situation. So we're throwing out phrases like a healthy diet, a sustainable diet, a plant-based diet, a diet with a low environmental impact. And we really have to question what the root of those words are. So like our first speaker, um, really getting to the, the meaning behind them and trying to understand, are these phrases synonymous with one another? Are they interchangeable? Are they one and the same? And as consumers, you know, just regular everyday people living with the practicalities in the real world, is it possible for us to have all of those things or will we have to accept that there are some trade-offs and potentially unintended consequences as we attempt to optimize across these different domains and dimensions? In the animal ag sector, we see that this is being done through the use of technology and other innovations and constantly striving to create a product that is not only appetizing of high quality, but is also safe and affordable so that the majority of people have access to it. When we look at that from a nutrition point of view, the same thing. How do we balance our messaging to tell the story of this food in a way that doesn't elicit more discomfort or fear around those food choices? So next slide, please. One example that I always like to pull as we go back to that concept of questioning whether these phrases are one and the same is trying to understand what people are really looking for and the emotions that drive their food purchasing behaviors. Um, in, in some cases, what they say they want and how they actually uh, purchase food or prepare it in their home are not necessarily in alignment. So for example, we see that people um, are rather uncomfortable with the idea that um, animal agriculture may be contributing to things like climate change. However, when we look at the data with a critical eye, what we see is that not only is that narrative not rooted in truth or evidence, but in reality, um, farmers and ranchers and food producers across the industry have made very drastic improvements in what they're able to produce with fewer total animals. So again, getting to the underlying desires of what consumers are asking for may shape how we respond to their questions um, and how we drive that narrative forward in a way that's more productive and less contentious or confrontational than it could potentially be. So next slide, please. Uh, for this last bit of my introduction, just bringing it full circle to the story of communication and how we can be, become more primed and prepared um, to champion the story of how food comes from farm to table. Um, if we shift our language to be more reflective of what those desires and emotions are, um, there's an opportunity to appeal to the interests and emotions of those people we serve. And again, arrive at this nuanced middle ground that is often challenging to see. Um, as humans, we really are driven towards this binary black and white thinking. We love to oversimplify and we love to categorize things, including food, into very neat little compartments. And as we know in the real world, there's a large amount of gray space in between. And that's what this panel is intended to, to get at, is navigating that nuance in between the black and white. So with that, I'll conclude my introduction and hand the controls over to Allison um, before we get to our Q&A portion of the session. Okay, thanks, Kara, and, and thanks, Nicole. I'm just going to pull my slides up really quickly to share with you all. Okay, here we go. So, so thanks again both to, to Kara and Nicole. I think you provided some really thought-provoking insights that transition really nicely into the information that I'm about to present, which is research on consumer perceptions about popular nutrition bu buzzwords related to protein. And, and for the purposes of this brief presentation, I'm gonna focus on uh, sustainable and plant-based, which have really exploded in popularity lately and at times are, are really key purchasing drivers for many people. So the information that I'm going to be sharing today comes from a few recent surveys that IFIC has conducted on these topics. Here's my disclosure. Um, I am an employee of IFIC, which is a nonprofit that is supported by a uh, broad base of food, beverage, and agriculture companies. So I'm going to start with the term sustainable or sustainability. Uh, and, and the first point I want to make is that sustainability is important to consumers. Uh, we ask this question, uh, we've asked it for a few years now, I, I think, on, um, you know, how important is it to you that the food products that you're purchasing, the food products that you're eating, 
are produced in an environmentally sustainable way. And we see that for over half of individuals, they do say that this is somewhat, at least somewhat important to them. So sustainability is something that people are thinking about when they are deciding what to buy and what to eat. And at the same time, it's difficult and really confusing for consumers to know whether their food choices are environmentally sustainable. So we have over six in 10 individuals saying that this is the case for them, that they find it really difficult to, to know this information about their food. Um, there's really no one label or one system in place that people can look to to decide if something is environmentally sustainable. So in lieu of this, people are looking to other labels on food packaging or sometimes even the food packaging itself. Uh, to influence their perception of environmentally sustainable products. So things like um, being labeled as locally grown, sustainably sourced, um, non-GMO or not bioengineered, and organic, those things are really rising to the top when people are looking for more information on sustainability. Um, packaging to some extent is also important to people. Things like using recyclable or minimal packaging can also convey a sense of sustainability. So specifically when it comes to animal protein, um, people look to labels like no added hormones, grass fed, again, locally raised um, when they are uh, looking for things to indicate sus environmentally sustainable animal protein. Uh, now switching gears over to plant-based, um, we see that people are really split on what they think plant-based means. Um, we uh, asked this question in our last food and health survey as well, took a little different approach than Nicole's poll that she just did, um, but you know we found answers that you know are, are an interesting comparison I think in both of them. Um, so the question that we specifically asked was which of the following of these definitions on the screen uh, matches how you would define a plant-based diet? And um, we were really surprised to see the spread here. We see that almost a third of individuals equate plant-based to mean a vegan diet when, in which you're avoiding all animal products, no eggs, no dairy, no meat. Um, just uh, about three in 10 people said, uh, had a, a little bit of a different appro approach. They said that it was a diet that emphasized minimally processed foods, mostly from plants, but there's still some allowance for consumption of meat, eggs, and dairy. Um, we had a, a few fewer people saying that it was similar to a vegetarian diet. And then we had some people say that, you know what, I can just try to get as many fruits and vegetables as I can. I'm not really going to put any limits on my animal products. And then notably, we also had one in 10 individuals say that they really weren't even sure what plant-based meant to them. So they hadn't really taken it under consideration or just, you know, are, are relatively confused around the term. So I mentioned that uh, being associated with sustainable or plant-based can sometimes play into people's decisions on whether to buy or eat certain foods. And I wanted to use this particular slide to indicate that curiosity and openness to new things and, and being intrigued by novelty are also really big players in this space. Um, IFIC recently conducted a survey on plant alternatives to animal meat. Some of those products that are like burgers or sausages, et cetera, that are aiming to mimic the taste and the texture of meat. And um, we we're just curious, you know, about why people are trying these products and what they're thinking about them. Um, and so one of the questions that we asked is, you know, why did you decide to try one of these products? And we see that liking to try new foods and being curious about them are the top responses that we got, ranking even higher than things like thinking that these plant alternatives are better for the environment, they're made without harming animals, or that they're better for health. So this, um, uh, uh, again, this approach to novelty can really um, be an, an important factor as well. But um, all this being said, I want to start to bring things home by doing kind of a level set on where most people are at in this space. Uh, what we know from years and years of asking these questions is that there are other purchasing drivers that really do have a stronger share in people's decisions around food. Um, we have seen um, that taste is always at the top of the list. It's the number one influencer of what people are going to buy. And after this come price, helpfulness, and convenience kind of clustered up together. Sustainability is really a distant fifth. Um, so yes, sustainability is important to many people. We saw that in the first slide, but when the rubber really meets the road, it's just not at the level of these other impact factors. They're gonna come first when people are at the grocery store and making those food decisions. And lastly, I just wanna emphasize that by and large, in all of these conversations around plant and animal protein and sustainability, most people believe that there is room for both in an environmentally sustainable diet. Um, it's not black and white, it's not an either or decision. Um, so we need to keep this in mind and know that many people are really open to having a discussion or a conversation about animal protein and sustainability. Um, and this is an important part of communicating with your audience. 
So I just want to wrap things up with a quick slide of takeaways. Um, the first is that definitions matter. Um, being clear about where you stand on your approach to environmental sustainability or on plant-based is a really great way to develop trust with your customers, with your clients, with your patients, etc. Um, they might not necessarily agree with your definition. They might be uh, on a different page as we've seen from that, the plant-based definitions. Um, they might take a different approach to things, but at least they know where you stand. Uh, the second takeaway is that um, these terms do matter to people. They are popular, but other factors are really more top of mind when it comes to what people are buying and what they're eating. And then the last thing again is just that our personal beliefs about food are not black and white. And, and Kara also said this as well. There's really so much gray area when it comes to what we buy and how we're eating. So um, and just keeping that in mind when you are thinking about uh, how to approach these conversations, that's a really critical piece. So I'm going to stop there, I think, and, and turn it back over to Tom for questions. Thank you very much, Allie. Um, let's see, our top audience question right now at the moment, I am going to direct to Kara. How can we normalize meat as part of a sustainable diet when studies such as those published by the WHO recommend plant-based and Mediterranean diets for long-term environmental sustainability? Sure, that's a great question and one that often comes up in lots of different networks that I that I run with. Um, when we see these evidence-based sources and these really trusted and credible and familiar organizations such as the WHO um, coming out with these guidelines and recommendations, it's important not to discount it. They have you know, great people on their teams um, and they've really done their due diligence to try to cover all of their bases. So at no point as a dietitian would I necessarily dispute or disagree with those recommendations recommendations, especially after doing that legwork, um, kind of tracing it back to the source. But what we have to also remember is that there's a clear distinction oftentimes between these idealistic recommendations and then the practicalities and the challenges of living in the real world. And I think now, unfortunately, more than ever, um, this pandemic has shined a light on the, those challenges. So um, when we're looking to normalize meat consumption or its ability to be included as part of an overall eating pattern, I think we have to take in those other factors that Allison pointed out in, um, in those survey responses. So things like affordability and access um, are always going to be the key drivers, as well as taste and individual preference. Um, so one of the, the prime examples of where those two didn't necessarily align in a way that made sense for many people is the recent Eat Lancet report. So, you know, study methodologies aside, um, just to summarize what that came out with was a new recommendation that there would be less meat consumption, um, both for personal and planetary health. However, when you really dug into the nitty gritty of that report, what we ended up finding was that affordability was the biggest barrier for most people worldwide. If one were to try to follow those recommendations as they were written, it would come out to an average cost of $2.84 per day. And when you extrapolate that out over a global population, that's far, far out of reach for many people um, in other nations, including the United States. So I think when we're looking to normalize the um, inclusion of, of animal proteins in our diet, we really have to look at that nuance of how we can overlay what we know to be true about nutrition science and public health recommendations, as well as what's practical and sustainable for families um, and using sustainable in that sense of what are the food behaviors and habits that they can truly maintain without contributing additional stress or chaos to an already stressful mealtime. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Nicole, you are both a proud meat eater and involved with the Have a Plant campaign. How do you, how do you go about balancing those two interests? Well, truly they go hand in hand. So what the <clears throat> Have a Plant campaign is all about is putting whole plants forward on your plate, whether that's fresh, frozen, canned, or even in the form of juice. And the reason I did want to partner with them is because it is taking things back to basically the produce aisle or the frozen food aisle. We're not talking about plant-like substances or plants that are masquerading as other products. Um, so to me, again, it's just that natural partnership. And what I've attempted to do 
more recently is highlight some of the ways in which those segments of agriculture work together. How do cattle take foodstuffs left behind from production of things that we eat, those inedible bits, how do they utilize those to minimize the carbon footprint of both segments? Um, so I think it's really a, a very natural partnership. And what a lot of these trends that Allison highlighted is I think that's where 96% of us in America are really at. We're looking to eat more fruits and vegetables and we are enjoying those meat products. Great, our next uh, question from the audience. I will turn to Ali first, but I wanna, I wanna ask each of you this as well. How do you define clean food and how does this possibly apply to consumer understanding of how food is produced? And I'll editorialize, does the word clean food make you cringe? <laughs> You've, you can read my face very easily, I'm sure. This is such a challenging question. Um, I think being in the food space and the research space, we, we know, especially on a, an issue like clean, it's something that seems so basic at the ground level. Like, well, I should be able to know if my food is clean or not. But the more you dig into it and the more you learn and the more you figure out the different angles of, you know, and the different approaches to food, it becomes such a challenge to define what that is. I myself don't personally have a definition of clean um, because I found it to be, you know, such a challenging um, discussion to have. And there are so many different voices about this and so many, um, you know, different um, ways that you can think about it. So I, I unfortunately don't have a really great answer to this question. Maybe Kara and Nicole could, could be more <laughs> informative. Kara, what do you think? Yes, I don't know if I'll be able to extrapolate too much more. I remember there was a, a Kansas City event uh, years ago. This was when um, the Ag Chat events were still happening. And uh, I participated, participated in a panel there. And my response was that my definition of clean eating was food without visible dirt on it. <laughs> so again, taking it back to that very literal meaning um, and just opening that up, I find in conversations with clients in the nutrition space or um, you know, in my consulting and writing work, trying to craft those messages, um, clean eating is such a nuanced term. Once again, this is a theme that keeps coming up because everyone seems to have their own um, their own definition, and that's shaped by perhaps personal experience, um, whether that's with the healthcare system, um, with the food system, or where they're getting their food from. Um, we know that this is heavily influenced by media messages and what we're exposed to in that space. And then more importantly than ever, I think it's these personal relationships. So if you have a close friend or a family member that's really had an influential voice in your life and how you relate to food, I think that message can get strewn in various different directions. Um, and ultimately we see that confusion coming to head in the grocery aisle where these labels are generating even more confusion at the point of purchase. Great, thank you. Um, our next question, I think Ali already answered. Sustainability is important to consumers, but does it change the actual purchase decision? Um, I, I think she answered that in her presentation and that was no, as we saw that way down the list of things people think when they actually go to purchase the product. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, so, uh, Nicole, someone wanted to know, uh, as a New Yorker, how did you come to be so passionate about the beef industry? You know, we all think about New York as a big dairy state. You're not from Kansas or Nebraska. How did you become so passionate about the beef industry? So as a student, I had attended the New York State Academy meeting and I met a lovely woman named Cindy Chan Phillips and always just being a steak lover my whole life. I was like, wow, this woman is a dietitian and she's here at a beef booth at a dietetics council meeting. This is amazing. Uh, didn't hear from her from like another two years and she found a blog of mine that had nothing to do with beef when I was just starting out but invited me on a farm tour in the Finger Lakes region and I had an opportunity to get on a cow-calf operation. I had an opportunity to uh, do some meat fabrication and learned about the MBA program and just wanted to take a deeper dive 
into something that's always seemed to be a controversial topic. And it really just went from there. Well, let me ask you, uh, piggybacking on, on that question, you know, it's, you know, meat is sometimes a very controversial topic and you're actively involved in, in promoting it on social media. And, you know, we all know a lot of times that that draws out, you know, some of our detractors. H have you experienced that? And how do you deal with that? And who ha is there a threshold that you use to, uh, you know, engage or not with, with people? I think that's such a great question. And I was just reminded of this again. Last week, I had Dr. Frank Mitloner on my podcast. And again, he brought up the point of, we're not worrying about the 4% who are vegan. We're not really worried about the 4% who are carnivore, right? So in my promotion, yes, I do draw some of that ire, uh, especially from really staunch, zealous vegans. But it's all about, to me, it's all about civility. I did take, take a pledge of civility with the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So uh, I know that's not someone I'm going to spend too much time with interacting because that's not my audience. If you're vegan, you're vegan. And that's, that's fine. That's your choice. And it's great that you can make that choice. Um, but it is important I think how we engage with those people in a civil manner, because it's not just that one individual paying attention to how I'm reacting, but it's all the different people around them as well. Um, I do have other followers who are a little bit more aggressive than I am, who might step into a comment section and point out uh, hypocrisies in an argument from someone who is overly zealous, but I really try and take the high road every time I can, and maybe invite them to listen to uh, listen to some of my some of my information that I provide with other speakers and things. Okay, I think this next one is good for Allie. Um, you know, based on a lot of your consumer research. How do you talk about animal welfare within the sustainability discussions you have with consumers, especially those not familiar with agriculture? Is that something that's come up in your research, Allie? You're, you're on mute, Allie. You know, I have gone so long in these months of working <laughs> remotely, not doing that. And of course it would happen now. Um, I, I was saying, you all could not hear, um, that we do a lot of work at IPIC around this. Our, our audience is the general public, those that are health interested or they're interested in, in topics of food production, but may not necessarily, you know, have an educational background in it formally anyway, and are, are looking for more information in an easily to digest um, manner. So we do a lot of um, articles, um, fact sheets, infographics, that kind of thing as topics to familiarize people with them. Um, the, the animal welfare discussion you know, is a challenging one, but our approach is to just really simplify it, take it back to the farm for people to understand more about how exactly you know, these animals are raised, what it's like to be a farmer, what it's like to go through the everyday practices of raising animals. And you know, yes, um, the, the end point is the grocery store, um, and we have to you know, talk a little bit about that process as well, but I think it's just taking a, a more um, you know, humanistic approach to it and, and talking about it from you know, a really relatable level and an easy to understand terms. Um, and, and then just being really responsive to the things that we're seeing on social media when people ask us questions or, or are, are pushing us a little bit on the topics that we're talking about, you know, engaging in, in the discussion about that and, and learning from people who are feeding information into us is really important as well. So I um, work more on the nutrition side. We have a whole food production side uh, of people that are working with IPIC as well, and they are brilliant writers and are, and are great explainers of this information. So I would point people to, to our website if you're looking for any basic information on how to talk to people about animal welfare. So Ali, speaking of your research, a couple people asked, did you ask the respondents to define the different labels? You know, we didn't. We don't ask to, uh, people to define the different labels that we see on food products. Um, many, some of them, like um, natural or local, are produced in a lot of different ways. There's not kind of a standard uh, sort of a stamp of a label that is consistent across food packaging. Organic, I think people kind of know what to look for there. And so, um, you know, we didn't necessarily say the certified organic label, but 
people generally know what we mean when we say the organic label. So no, and a lot of times in, in IFIC research, not just specifically to labels, but when we talk about these, um, these terms, we deliberately leave the terminology open. We don't necessarily define it in our survey because we want to leave room for people to be able to answer the question in the way that they interpret it. Um, and so that's a learning um, for, from our research as well, is just learning you know, about where people are at when they are answering these questions. So we wouldn't necessarily want to always put forth our own personal definition because um, you know, that might kind of throw them off what they would, how they would respond. Okay, uh, next question I wanna to throw to Kara. Um, conversations about what we eat can be tricky because you know, eating decisions are very personal. We all know that. What advice do you have for us about engaging effectively in that regard? Yes, I think you alluded to the, the key right there is that acknowledgement that there are very deep rooted beliefs about food and those often stem from personal experiences or early childhood memories. So if we can find that connection point of however small it may be, um, this is going to reiterate a lot of the communication strategies that you've likely heard in the past, but it can't be overemphasized enough. Um, when we present first with the data or a science minded approach um, we often see the adverse effect of what we intend, and it has the, the tendency to repel versus draw someone into a more engaging conversation. Um, we also have to understand that a lot of people at this point are struggling with this desire for familiarity and comfort from food. Um, just, you know, tipping a hat to the current situation and understanding that food is more emotional and personal than ever, especially as we're lacking the sense of control in other facets of life. Um, so at this particular point in time, that may be the starting point for some of these conversations behind food choices um, and why people purchase or prepare food the way that they do. Um, we have to recognize and honor the autonomy in other people. And that's one of the key learnings that I've taken away from working with individuals who struggle with disordered eating or chronic cycles of dieting and, and attempted weight loss. Um, when we recognize and honor that autonomy, we start to understand that they're not necessarily making an ignorant or ill-informed decision, but rather they're acting out of an attempt to live out their values. So if we can connect on some of those similar values, then that can really start a more productive conversation into not only understanding the why behind their choices, um, but also informing us on how we might share or present information when the conversation finally takes a turn in that direction. Um, and we have more opportunity to share the why behind our choices, whether that's in raising animals intended for the food supply, um, if that's at the point of sale or in another sector of the industry. Um, but I think recognizing and understanding that our behaviors are driven from our personal values, um, that could add an additional layer of, of context that can be helpful. Thank you. Um, this is a great question and I've, I've definitely shared these photos on Instagram and Twitter. I'm gonna give this one to Nicole. These photos of stockouts and meat departments showing no meat offerings and a full complement of plant-based offerings still on the shelf. From those photos, it appears that even a pandemic and lack of meat is not translating to sales of plant-based meat. What does this say about the actual demand for these products when consumers vote with their wallets? So again, going back to this quote of paying attention to <clears throat> trend lines and not headlines, we know that people are, were curious pre-pandemic about some of these products, but again, these were, these were largely meat eaters who were sort of delving into and experimenting into some, some of these plant-based alternatives. Um, so reflecting back on what Kara was just saying, we're in a time of comfort, we're in a time of resurgence of middle of the aisle purchases, people are finding probably some of those moments and reminding like, what makes me feel good in this time? And listen, I'm not an economic forecaster, but some of these plant-based alternatives, they do not have enough of that history with the average consumer because these are relatively new SKUs. So 
if I had to guess, I'd say there are very few individuals sitting back now and saying, oh, wow, I remember that time with my grandma having the Impossible Burger. I mean, that's just not a conversation that's being had. It's probably not desirous as a comfort food at the moment. I know that we're still waiting on data for sustainability of production um, of some of those items. So you'll read different things, but I don't think anyone is anticipating sales of those items once the economy is normalized, outpacing any animal products. So I hope that I hope that more or less answered your question. Um, I have tended not to post those photos because, again, I'm not trying to uh, belittle anyone else's food choice. That doesn't really win any anyone over from making that food choice and coming over to the meaty side, as it were. So uh, I have refrained from making a big deal out of it, but. Honestly, it is, uh, it is an eye-opener. It's, it's very interesting to see that they sit untouched. That might offend your have a plant uh, interests as well. <laughs> <laughs> have gonna... a plant, but not a plant-based burger. <laughs> um, Kara, when we talk about sustainability, the term of 40% food waste comes up in this country. Many, re many reasons play a part of that waste number, both on the food production side as well as consumers handling and cooking food. Are consumers willing to accept responsibility to be more efficient in their use of food, i.e. better menu planning or using food that is less than perfect? Yeah, that's a great question and certainly something that we've known and been aware of for quite some time. Um, it's no secret within you know, the industry, anyone who is connected to agriculture or working within food systems, that there's a great deal of waste that's happening past the point of purchase. So not even necessarily in the retailers, but in our own home kitchens. And to go to that point about, you know, whether or not consumers are willing to accept that they have a greater role to play in doing their part to reduce or minimize that impact. Um, I think the jury is still out in, you know, just personal conversations. And in my experience, um, this is probably reflective of just the network of people that I have in my life. But the common thread that I've noticed is that we tend to carry this attitude of, well, that happens elsewhere, but not in my kitchen because I'm not really like that. I do my part and I really try hard. So people like to kind of carry this aura of concern or awareness, um, woke, if you will. You know, they're very aware of these issues and they understand that they do trickle out into to other facets. But at the same time, they're sometimes struggling with the recognition that um, this is a systems issue. It's not necessarily a reflection of poor personal habits or, you know, your own um, inability to follow guidelines or rules, if you will. Um, people also like that, um, that autonomy and the free choice to say, you know, if I can afford to choose to prepare different meals throughout the week, that novelty and excitement in the kitchen sometimes come th comes through more strongly. Um, and that choice is sometimes reflected in more food going into the garbage can at the end of the night. Um, we notice this a little bit more in more affluent families because again, they have the ability to purchase foods that are less familiar. They may be attempting um, fancier recipes or things that include more ingredients. And what we often find is with things like fresh produce or fresh herbs, recipes that call for very small amounts leave quite a bit in the fridge or on the countertop, which is sometimes forgotten, sometimes pushed to the back of the shelf. Um, so I think we can all do our part by not only highlighting um, some of those unconventional ways that can perhaps encourage people to, um, you know, include these, these foods on their shopping list and get them in their grocery carts, but then also bringing it back to the simplicities of, you know, how do we go back to basics with storing food, um, you know, saving leftovers or repurposing them so that they're appetizing enough to want to eat versus, you know, waiting till the end of the week and seeing them disappear somewhere else. Um, but it is a challenge, and I think there's um, a lot of effort being done on, on both sides of that equation and only speaks to the amount of work that we continue to have to do um, to get that message out there. 
I'll just jump Great. in quickly and say that um, I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this all shakes out. Um, you know, when we're amid this pandemic and, and how things equilibrate, if they do at all, af after we're, we're sort of um, through the woods more or less, whenever that, that may happen. I think that with more people being inside their homes and more people cooking more at home, um, there is likely uh, more attention being paid to the foods that are in our refrigerators. and and um, you know, trying to waste less because we're aware of what is in the fridge more than we would if we were you know, busy elsewhere. And I also think another key um, point about this is that this pandemic is going to be very hard, already is hard economically for many people. And I think that will really play into people's, um, uh, the way that they approach the food that they, they do have and being really mindful of trying not to, to waste any of it to get their grocery budgets to stretch further. Um, but I do know what his final question was going to be, so I will go ahead and pose that to each of you. Uh, so what is the one action item you have for everyone listening today based on what you've shared? So how do we take these great concepts and turn them into executable action items? We can go in the order that you spoke with us. So we'll start with Nicole. I would say don't hesitate to share your story. Uh, there are a lot of ranchers whom I really admire on social media, really taking ownership on that on certain platforms such as Instagram specifically and putting themselves out there and giving a really broad audience a glimpse into their day. Uh, just piggybacking on what was mentioned in the uh, panel prior to ours, uh, transparency matters. Uh, people want to see what you're doing. There is this interest in where food comes from. And I think showcasing all of the love and care that goes into animals that you are proud enough to feed your own families, a little bit of that goes such a long way. Great. And Kara? Yeah, so as my my closing statement, I want to go back to what I mentioned earlier about those values and how they drive not only our behaviors, but also in business and industry, um, how we choose to practice and operate the way that we do. Um, as a word of encouragement to anyone listening, what's been helpful for me has been to get very clear on what those values are and then be prepared with some examples of how those come to life, whether that's an example of changes that you've made within your operations, um, kind of what your line in the sand is, so to speak, of what you are and are not willing um, to do or or enact within your operations. And I think having those at the ready can be a great way whenever these tough issues do come up. Um, at the end of the day, we are all humans. And so there's this inherent level of humanity in each and every conversation. And if that's the only common ground that you share, that may still serve as a helpful starting point. So again, in summary, just get a lot of clarity on what your own personal and professional values are, and then have some in your toolkit to just pull out at the ready and share those examples when the opportunity arises. And Allie. Yeah, I um, will also echo something that I said in my takeaways. Uh, if you haven't already done so, I think it would benefit really everyone to spend some time thinking about what these commonly used but not necessarily well-defined phrases and terms mean to you. Um, thinking about what's your your organization's philosophy around them, um, because this is really a crucial piece of building trust um, is having the people that you are interacting with know where you stand um, and having this foundation built out is really important. Um, and yes, I did see one of the, the questions remaining in the Q&A when we're thinking about sustainability. Yes, absolutely. Be thinking about the modifiers and the adjectives that go along with that. Um, just as an example of why it's important to think about, you know, what all sustainability entails to you is that in our survey, we saw that when we use the modifier environmentally sustainable, we saw a big drop off in its um, purchasing impact by I think 12% from the year where we just said sustainable to environmentally sustainable. So clearly people are not on the same page and, and don't all have the same um, things that they're rolling into what their own perceptions of sustainability are. So the more clear you can be about the terminology, the better. And then also just remember that how you define some of these things isn't static. It doesn't have to be. Um, it can evolve with the science and with you or your organization's vision too. So keeping up on the latest research, keeping a pulse on you know, what's being talked about in the media and, and where, your, um, where your audience is at is really important. Great. Well, I think Tom has rejoined us. So I will let you I've rejoined. kick your children off the internet. <laughs> 
<laughs> I will let you take it home for us. Thank you. Um, John, can we pull up those poll results? Let's see what the audience thought about the panelists' favorite uh, chicken dishes. Here we go. Uh, let's see. Yogurt marinated chicken kebabs with cilantro dipping sauce. Congratulations, Kara. Thank you. Very and good. Um, I did see some comments on Twitter that it is perhaps the most bougie of all the options presented. But I did share a photo that I believe was quite appetizing. Lots of colors. We did have vegetables represented. So again, Absolutely. building that bridge between the other, the other part of the plate, as Nicole would say. That's great. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I'll be listening to um, Randy Travis, Dave Matthews, and Faith Hill during the virtual happy hour this afternoon. So with that, uh, thank you all very much. Thank you audience for the questions and I